Hello and welcome to our co-webinar with SaneBox for setting up your team from an optimal async environment. My name is Rex. I'm from the customer success team at Text Expander. Our co-host today is Jennifer. She's also from the success department. You want to say hello? Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer. It's nice to have you join us on this lovely afternoon or whatever time of the day it is where you're joining us from. Yes. So we're going to give a few minutes for everyone to kind of trickle in and get everyone logged in. Um, so while we do that, um, there is a chat box and also a Q&A box in your Zoom bar. If you wanna open those up, that is how we will be able to, um, to speak with one another and to answer questions. So let's go ahead and start us off with um, a question about um, spring. Spring has sprung for us. And so we're <laughs> kind of seeing like what everyone does during the springtime. For me, I'm about to plant my garden um, if it ever warms up. Um, no. So if you have your chat box handy, if you have your Q&A box handy, go ahead and drop in what spring means to you. What are your fun things that you do during spring? Yeah, definitely. I've got both of those popped open here for, for me to see. And I know Rex does as well, so we'll be able to see what you have to say. Um, I can tell you though, Rex, yesterday it snowed all day. And so um, while spring has sprung and my hyacinths and my tulips are up, the tulips have not fully bloomed yet. Um, I think that they got a little shock to their little flower system yesterday. And But thankfully they're spring flowers and they're built for that, right? Um, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, let's see, we have someone who says, oh, the water has finally warmed up and they will be surfing on the East Coast. So well, sounds exciting. Man, I don't have that. I'm in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, Rex, do you mind introducing Dimitri? He, he has uh, popped in here. Yes, this is Dimitri. He's CEO and founder, co-founder of uh, Sane Box. You want to say hello? Hey, guys. Hi, Dimitri. <laughs> so we're so just talking what a, a little bit about spring. Spring. Spring has sprung. Um, yes. Unless you're exactly. in the Southern Hemisphere, then it's actually fall right now. So let's not. That is true. Uh, this is true. Yes. So what is it? Now. Yeah. What is it where you are? Please feel free to use either that Q and A um, or the chat room. If you just want to use the chat room right now, that's totally fine. Let us know where you are zooming in from, where you're joining us from, and uh, whether it's spring or fall for you. Absolutely. So it looks like we have a good amount of folks. Let's go ahead and dive in. We've got a lot of content for you today. So, oh, Northern Virginia, how much? Oh, how yeah. fun. Spain, spring, but snowy. That I, I feel you. It's spring, but it's snowy. Oh, it was yesterday. Yes, it is a cold one for sure. Yes. Doug, I'm in Ohio. It snowed yesterday, but we'll be <laughs> in the 80s by Sunday. So, you know, turn around and the weather changes. Absolutely. It actually was very cold yesterday and today it's beautiful outside. So I'm itching to get out there and maybe grill something, experience that lovely weather. So yes, chomping at the bit. And and you have uh the big race coming up in a couple of weeks too. So we sure do. The derby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah be fun. Well, guys, and we have so Rodrigo much from Chile who is experiencing a warm fall. A warm fall. Like a oh, very good. All right. Well, awesome. thank you all for sharing and testing out that chat room and making sure that that's working. We certainly do appreciate it. I think Rex and Dimitri, if you all are good to go, I think we're looking pretty good and um, every all systems are go here on my end if you all want to take over. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Right. Perfect. So welcome again. So again, just to reiterate our topic, we're going to talk to you today about how to be to set up your team for an async environment, the best practices, what you can do to make sure that you succeed in an async work environment. So I, like I said, I'm Rex. I'm the training enablement manager at Tex Expander. I live in Louisville, Kentucky, um, really fun spot in the, in the U.S. Um, and a fun fact about myself is I can play six instruments. Um, and here is, let me let Jennifer introduce herself. 
Hi, my name is Jennifer Burnett, and I am a customer success manager with Text Expander. Rex and I get to work every day together. We thoroughly enjoy it. I am out of Ohio in Ravenna, and a fun fact about me is that I once played Doris Day in a musical. I will be here as your co-host today, so if you have any questions, use that Q&A drop at the bottom of your Zoom window at the bottom of your screen. You can use the chat room as well, but if you do have questions, try and use the Q&A uh, room for us. That would be greatly appreciated. So if you need anything, pop it in. And last but certainly not least, Dimitri. So my name is Dimitri and uh, my fun fact is I can also play a lot of musical instruments, but I play all of them poorly, unlike <laughs> Rex. Oh, I didn't say I was great at playing them. I just, you know, <laughs> I attempted to play them. But our band, we will be releasing our, our first album soon, Jen, Jen Dimitri and I, and uh, we'll, we'll hold a concert for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so today we've got a few things to cover. So we're going to cover what asynchronous communication is, how to get started with your team, and what some best practices are. And then of course, towards the end of the call, we're going to open this up to some questions from you all so that we can try to share what we know about asynchronous communication, asynchronous work, uh, and see if it can help you in your, your endeavors. So what is async communication? Dimitri, you want to kick us off? Sure thing. So, you know, the definition is it's communication that's not synchronous, but <laughs> as, as, as the name suggests. So it's not shared, it's not sent and received at the same time. And uh, really, this is a, you know, relatively new concept. Uh, it's, uh, you know, started becoming more and more popular when since email was introduced into the, the kind of the work and the work environment, but it got really accelerated over the last couple of years uh, with COVID. And, you know, of course, now, since everybody's been doing it for a couple of years, uh, we understand uh, much more of the benefits and, um, you know, nobody's, essentially nobody wants to come back to the office anymore, right? So 60% of uh, people looking for a job say they would prefer to work uh, remotely. And half of the people uh, as of late last year are working remotely today. So the future of work is asynchronous kind of by default. And so it's super important that all of us get as good at it as we possibly can. And this is what this webinar is all about. Absolutely, thank you. So, so before we talk about asynchronous work, let's talk a little bit about like what this, what asynchronous work, uh, how it speaks to synchronous work or the downsides of synchronous work. So one thing that stands out to me about asynchronous work versus synchronous work is that synchronous work really favors certain kinds of people. Um, so you really favor in a typical workspace, if you have that typical nine to five work day, it's gonna favor folks who are productive, most productive early in the morning. Um, so you're, you're favoring folks who have a very specific circadian rhythm, so to speak. And also there's a, another component where it favors the, the folks that are neurotypical or um, it puts neurodivergent folks at a disadvantage. So neurodivergent folks, those are folks that maybe um, have ADHD or rest somewhere on the autism spectrum. They have, you know, some different, uh, I like to call it neurodiversity. Um, so, you know, it's a, a different way that their brains work. And so asynchronous communication, asynchronous work provides them this safe space to work with their own, you know, cognition, their own patterns of cognition. Additionally, there are some downsides to uh, ignoring the cultural differences between people. So a rigid work schedule doesn't always allow folks to, you know, if you're a, a parent and you have children, you have to go pick them up um, at, at preschool or daycare or grade school, um, you, may, you may have some religious practices that, that necessitate you go to your mosque in the middle of the day. And so a, a rigid work schedule really doesn't help you do that. And also thinking about those folks who are taking care of their families, not maybe just children, but also, you know, the elders in their family. So this provides the space and opportunity for them to be great caregivers for their families. And then lastly, there's also some, some downsides to time zone biases. So when you work in a synchronous environment, um, Typically, if you have a workspace, you're going in, or if you're if you are remote but synchronous, um, you're gonna you're gonna work with folks who are on the same time zone as you, and so that can sometimes limit uh, the amount of people that you have access to, or the people that can work with you and your team, and so you might be shortchanging the talent on your team by by doing so. Um, yeah. So the benefits of um, of async workplaces are kind of the opposite of what what Rex, what you just talked about. Um, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to also point out that it's important that uh, 
there's uh, the, the, the workspace is either fully synchronous or fully asynchronous. Uh, if there's this the, the hybridization in some cases puts a lot of people at a disadvantage. So if, if there is a kind of a central office where let's say half of the people are working in one location and the other half is is you know remote, that that is not great for for culture. So it's really important to kind of keep that in mind and uh, you know put uh, kind of policies and, and best practices in place to uh, make up for those for those difficulties. But really, uh, the benefits uh, of async workplace are, you know, ha have been quite obvious for some time, at least to us at, at Sandbox. And we, when we started the company, uh, this was 11 years ago, uh, we were remote from the beginning. And uh, we kind of you know, almost stumbled into it. Uh, what happened in our case is we had uh, kind of the core group of founding engineers uh, used to work at a previous company together in in Boston, and then uh, two of them split up to to be closer to their families. So one of them moved to Michigan, one moved to North Carolina, and kind of we realized that you know, in order to allow the freedom for, to you know for our core team. Uh, to live the life they want, we have to be asynchronous. And very quickly, it became obvious that there's a lot of benefits to this. And so we, you know, for example, we were able to hire engineers, uh, you know, not just in San Francisco and competing with, you know, Google and Facebook, but we're able to hire amazing talent all across the country. Uh, so it really helps with talent acquisition. The inclusivity part is just as important. Uh, pretty much everybody on our team uh, for a long time has kids. And so, you know, allowing people the flexibility to go pick up their kids and you know, have a flexible work day uh, was an incredible advantage. And we really valued that from the beginning. And then of course, uh, you know, the autonomy and empowerment that this gives to the team is, is really uh, is, is really an important uh, benefit as well. So, you know, as opposed to you know, having a office politics and kind of the water cooler, uh, time and that culture, uh, we allowed everybody to, you know, to have the autonomy and agency to do what they do best and do their work and, you know, not have to kind of not deal with all of the, the downsides of um, being, in, in, being in an office. And then, so last but not least, the mental health and, and well-being is, is a huge advantage. However, this one is a little bit of a double-edged sword. So, uh, there are a ton of benefits of, uh, you know, having kind of the not having to sit in traffic, for instance, right, or having to deal with co-workers you don't want to deal with. Um, and so there is, uh, it actually is much better for your mental health and, and well-being. However, there is a flip side to this. So especially for people who are more extroverted and really thrive in a social uh, situation, uh, we've we've seen how this isolation over over the last couple of years with COVID has resulted in some uh, you know negative ne negative side effects. And so you know we at Sandbox and I, I I know we talked about this before. You guys have implemented a kind of policies and best practices to counterbalance this, right? So you know having uh, offsites, whether they are uh, in person or virtual, and you know game nights and so on. That's something that we've been doing. What about you guys? Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned game nights. That's We actually have one coming up this evening. Um, and it's a really great opportunity for us to get together and not talk about work and bring back that, you know, communal workspace uh, benefit that you had. You know, when you go to the office, you start to learn about the people that you work with. Um, and sometimes asynchronous communication, you're, you're very um, on task, right? When you do get together and you're talking about a task or you're talking about a project, um, you don't have that space to really open up and say like, hey, I really love to play Mario Kart. You want to get together and play Mario Kart later. Um, we also do things like I, um, we have an after hours, like a, a time to get together, maybe like enjoy some wine together and talk about like what we like about wine, maybe be a little bit nerdy about it. Um, so there's really cool opportunities there. Um, trying to think of what we do do offsites as well. So we'll do, get together and, and pick a space, a location to come together as a team. And it might be sub teams or it might be the full team. And we get to like see each other in person, uh, which is really nice too. Yeah. We have weekly coffee chats as well, Rex. Yes. The coffee chats are great. So we, we actually leverage our technology to randomly pair us with one another each week. And we can then take 15 to 20 minutes to talk about something completely unrelated to work and just get to know one another. And I think, you know, people work for people and people work well with people. So, you know, building that strong community, building that connection with others only will benefit the work that you do together. 
Yes. What, what are some things that you do at Samebox? So before COVID, we used to do a, a one week every year, uh, actually, and then we switched it to two, uh, two times a year, but then COVID happened, so we had to stop that altogether. Uh, so we would just pick a week somewhere, uh, we we're doing it somewhere in the country in a cool location that everybody votes on, and just spend a week hanging out. We actually, we did do some work as well, so just kind of some strategic planning, but a lot of non-work uh, also. Uh, and then uh, since COVID, we've been doing uh, kind of the similar thing as you guys, game nights. Um, we So before COVID, we were really big on uh, escape rooms. So we would, would love doing escape rooms. And so with uh, with COVID there, I don't know if you guys know this, but there's kind of a, a new industry of virtual escape rooms. Which yes. Is mm-hmm. Just as fun, actually, surprisingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually just um, got uh, some information on a, a virtual escape room and I'm really interested in learning more. So I'll have to connect with you on that. Um, it's yeah it's all the fun without the the hassle it's great right (laughs) so what does asynchronous mean for your work life um the first thing is that you get to adapt a non-linear mindset and and especially for folks who are maybe uh bring that neurodiversity to your team this can be a super big benefit um so you can work around your priorities you can also work about work when you are most productive so you can kind of figure out and gamify your work life and figure out where you get the most return on your investment. Um, You also get the benefit of caring for your children and and pursuing hobbies and and maybe hobbies like incorporating some personal development into your day um, where you have a longer bit of time to like kind of figure out where are my gaps, where can I do something that can strengthen my ability to do my job. Um, And you squeeze more out of your day, which is really exciting. I really enjoy the nonlinear work work life. Um, you also get more work-life balance. And I know that's a, a hot button right now. Everyone, it's in the zeitgeist, um, but it really does provide that, that balance that you're looking for. Um, and the flexibility also, I think, leads to better mental resilience so that whenever you are, you know, when you have those more loaded up times that you're doing a lot of work, you also have those counterbalance times where you have more space to, to live your life and do your work. Um, and it does lead to fewer meetings. And then that in turn, Uh, provides more focus when you do meet. And I like to think of it this way too, like the idea that we're going to be 100% productive for eight hours out of a day, which a synchronous work environment kind of seems to suggest that's the, that's the goal. um, It's just not real. We don't have like our bodies and our brains just don't work that way. And so being more nonlinear and focusing more on work-life balance allows you to be a lot more uh, intensely productive when you're, when you're setting out to accomplish a goal. Um, and then you also see that that bears out in efficiency gains. So you see re- increased employee retention and those fewer meetings really does, it really does translate to less distractions when you do meet and more focus on what you're setting out to accomplish when you're meeting. So it's a really great way to approach your work, your work day. Definitely. So how do we get started? And I think one of the biggest things is intentionality. So really setting the intention before you get started of what you hope to accomplish, how you hope to accomplish it. And that's really what we're gonna talk about more in depth today. Um, and I think, Dimitri, you have a lot to say in, in, on this area, right? Yeah, so the, so the most, of, most of these bullets have to do with the idea of flow. And uh, so flow is a kind of a, a, I'm sure most of you have heard of this. It's this uh, state when you are uh, kind of entirely focused on what you're working on time kind of slows down or ceases to exist you're you know you're just in the zone this is what athletes uh, kind of refer to right when they're they they only see kind of their the, the target and everything else kind of disappears so we we can reach this individually and so there are uh, individual flow uh, flow triggers which uh, kind of help you get in the zone but what's really really cool is uh, group flow and so group flow is actually a um, is a state where it's not just that everybody is in that state of individual flow, but it's something else entirely different that happens. And so they, they first started studying group flow with jazz musicians. And so since we're all uh, musicians, uh, we, can, we can relate to that. But um, it's this, it's this, it's a completely different state where everybody kind of plays off of each other. And it's a really fun, um, you know, fun kind of state. And the, the really cool thing about this is the chemicals that get released in our uh, in our brain uh, during this state are uh, literally they're called the best drugs on earth 
Um, there, it's it's this, this. We love individual flow, but we really love this group flow. And so, with uh, asynchronous work environment, we really have an opportunity to to kind of foster uh, these uh, this group flow state. So, for example, you know, having shared goals is super critical. Having shared risk, uh, where you know there is a kind of a high consequence to. Um, to you know achieving or not achieving something is super important. Uh, the yes and is is one of the kind of the the, the tools from um, imp improv, right? Um, is is not saying no to people in, in the uh, you work with, and so the, the, you know we don't want to go too uh, too much in depth uh, into these. But um, if you want to look up group flow tr group flow triggers, uh, this is a really interesting topic and. Um, yes, it can be achieved in a synchronous environment, but it can also be achieved in an async environment, and it's even more powerful in that case. Absolutely. Well, actually, and then, so I wanted to end with, um, the, we're not going to go through all of them in too much, too much depth, but um, I want to, I want to highlight uh, open communication and documentation. So these are uh, very important topics that need to be um, need to be addressed kind of if, when we're setting up uh, the best process, uh, best practices for um, uh, for async environment. So making sure the communication is um, open, that it's uh, thoughtful and intentional, as you mentioned, Brex, is, is absolutely critical. And one of the one of the ideas is documentation becomes really really important because you know when you're not sitting in you know across from each other in a cubicle. And you're maybe in a different time zone. Having proper documentation and having the the person you're communicating with be able to just find what they need in their you know by themselves is really helpful. And so you know, we put a lot of uh, effort and thought into our documentation and the employee handbook, as we call it. Um, do you guys do something like that as well? Yeah, absolutely. We actually have. Um... Something that's really uh, simple but super impactful is we ha even have like a, a meeting etiquette guide. So when you get on to a call with others, you can like you know what's expected. So we want to keep our cameras on. We want to stay on task. We don't want to multitask while we're meeting. We want to make sure that this is a really impactful, um, good use of our time. Um, and, and really leveraging documentation. I think that's super important. I had a, a lit professor uh, back in undergrad that was really helpful to me uh, with this idea of like um, a trash document. So like anything that you wrote, she said, like, don't just delete it, don't get rid of it, save it for later. And I kind of think of that in the context of documenting your processes. You know, if you are, um, if you if you start to do a task and you're, and I think it's really important to kind of document as you go so that you're not adding a bunch of work later and it's top of mind while you're, while you're doing it. Um, but maybe you start a process, you start to like document that process and then you realize it's like halfway through, this isn't working. Rather than just abandoning that altogether, you can save that later and use that as um, a launching off point when you meet with your team to say like, here's something that I pursued. It turns out it wasn't the best, but do you have any insight on this? Can we like collab on this and maybe see if we could make something positive out of this? Um, so, and, and actually with intentionality and, and, and shared communication or shared, uh, shared, uh, lingo, if you will, uh, we have like uh, yay for failing. So like also identifying that like something not going well is actually just as important and is as much of a learning experience, a learning opportunity as doing something really, really well. In fact, I think it's probably a bigger opportunity. So, you know, always document what you're doing and save everything regardless of the outcome because it might become something useful in the long run. Yeah, but we we talk about this on the on the next slide. So let's maybe we should uh, dive in a little bit Absolutely. more. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, the, the the key kind of uh, um, mnemonic there is documentation trumps communication, right? And we we just talked about this uh, in depth. But uh, in another way, we, what we call is a handbook first approach, right? So the idea is uh, because I mean this is a good practice in general, right? Just for being a better uh, co-worker and a person is to anticipate your recipients, anticipate the needs of the person you're dealing with. But it is exceptionally important when you're dealing with different time zones and, and just asynchronously, right? Because in many cases, this could save you a, you know, a day long cycle, right? Just like waiting for the, for the person to wake up and, and vice versa. 
And so this is uh, this is just a extra extra important in um, in async work. Well, and then the other thing that's super important is uh, tone. Uh, as as everybody knows, it's pretty much impossible to uh, to pass tone in in written text, uh, and so. You know, use it being clear and direct and, and detail is important, but it's super helpful to be extra sensitive and just add a lot of add a lot of emojis for <laughs> lack of a better word. Sure. Um, yeah. So I put a I put a smiley maybe a little bit too much, but I Me I'm, too. I'm happy about it. <laughs> you too. <laughs> yeah. I think I think I err on the side of over emojification. Um, but you know, I think you it says something about my personality and I think it's important to still try to convey your personality in asynchronous communication or in remote work. Um, but also, you know, worst case scenario, you, know, you might just be like, the use too much emojis. Um, but I don't think, hopefully it's never too offensive or anything like that. Exactly. I don't think anybody got offended. At a, yeah. At a, at a <laughs> smiley, but, yeah. Well, and then, for, um, for, I was going to say guys, Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was going to say two things. Uh, we actually have a question from that I think would fit perfectly in right now. So do you mind if I pose that to you? All right. Perfect. Absolutely. So one of our attendees is wondering that, uh, assuming that team members has uh, in, are in different time zones, what suggestions would you have to ensure that email requests have clear statements of when a task or a report is due. Um, so, you know, a, a specific deadline. Um, so do you guys have any thoughts on that? Because I think that goes right back to communication. I actually have a lot of thoughts on this. I've, I've <laughs> <a lot> of, <laughs> uh, so, um, so short answer is absolutely. It, it is extremely helpful to be clear about deadlines and just intention in general. Um, so one of my favorite things to receive is an email that says not urgent for example right and so and you can do this you can put that message in kind of like a tag in the subject line uh, and that's when when you just think about it right if you receive an email that says not urgent it's yeah. almost like you're gaining time back right if you're it's, it's <laughs> you're yeah. just winning um so and, and if there is a clear deadline, it's really important to be uh, clear about it, right? So you can, again, even putting it in the subject is super helpful because that le lets the recipient, depending you know, how many emails they receive, right? Uh, it just lets them <clears throat> prioritize it, snooze it until the, you know, until the day where, when they need it. Um, yeah, Rex, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that this links really well back to the handbook, handbook first approach. So setting clear intentions. So like one that we have at Texas Fender is that we, we've agreed uh, collectively that we will we will respond within 24 hours. So we have a great, um, a great expectation there. And a response doesn't have to be like, I'm going to answer this question. Uh, it just means that I'm gonna let you know that I have seen this email or I've seen this Slack message. And it can be as simple as, as using an emoji uh, to, let, to make that clear. Um, I also think that like, I'm, I'm a formatting junkie. So I think it's really useful to leverage the tools in your email editor. So if there's something that needs to be top of mind, it needs to be very present, let's make it bold. Let's maybe center it. Let's italicize. And don't be afraid of your formatting to get the cross tone, I think as well. Um, and then lastly, leverage productivity tools. So if you're an Asana user, if you're um, using Todoist, whatever that might be for you, set a task. If there's a goal that you need, if there's something you need for me by a certain date, I always love if you can give me a task because I can go back and check it. I can prioritize it. I can see it on a, you know, depending on the, 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 the productivity tool you use, sometimes it'll throw it on a calendar for you. Um, and I think that can be really helpful in keeping you on task, but also seeing like how to best leverage your time because, you know, we all have a set amount of bandwidth. Um, so this helps you kind of like see where you can make the most gains in your day. Yeah, and actually, uh, just just to uh, highlight uh, Tarek's uh, point that he just made, um, yes. So using the subject wisely is a really really helpful tool. So yes, absolutely, Asana is uh, you know is better because you can you know, fit it within your workflow. Uh, but especially if you if you don't have Asana or if you're dealing with a you know, external partner, uh, email subject is kind of the only thing we have to, that lets you prioritize it. Um, so at Sandbox, we actually built a, a, a few tools that help you um, build kind of rules around it. So you can, you know, if something says, you know, uh, urgent, you can put it, you can make it top priority. If there's um, something that has an FYI, it's kind of less, you know, 
automatically less important. Um, that I'm forgetting one of them. Um, my favorite kind of a hack, I guess, is if you can fit the entire message in the subject line and then put EOM at the end, that stands for end of message. It's also just like, kind of like a gift because they know they don't have to open the message. Just everything is right there. Yeah, I had a professor who did that. He only would respond, uh, like he really only used the subject line. Um, so the, in that way, also kind of functioned more like a chat, but you also knew what was expected each time. Um, so that was really nice. And I believe you actually wanted to poll the audience today, didn't you, on what the favorite emoji for everyone was? Ooh, yes, can we do oh, that? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So if you'd like, go ahead and drop in the chat or in the Q&A, but I think the chat's probably a better uh, spot for that. Yeah. Uh, what your favorite emoji is, and let's contrast and compare. I can tell you that my favorite one is either the ta-da, like the one that's like the little, uh, like popper, if you will, um, or the little smiley face with the hands, because it's like, Okay. <laughs> what about you? I'm looking. Um, I'm not super familiar with these uh, Zoom emojis. They're a little bit different. Um, oh, here we go. <laughs> looks like Jason and I have a similar favorite. <laughs> nice. I'm loving them. Demetri, I'm all about that emoji that you just put up oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> I roll is the That's like my permanent mom emoji. <laughs> 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 With a little blow, the kiss one, you know. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Oh, well, thank Absolutely. you. I think you can keep dropping those in there and, and we'll go ahead and continue on our conversation. We appreciate those. Amy, I love Giphy. I love, I'm like, I'm annoying to a point with, with gifts or gifts, <laughs> however you wish to pronounce it. Um, so I'm on board with you there. <laughs> nice. Cool. And so like the key here, just to get back on topic, um, is to really deeply collaborate. So give each other a full idea of what's expected. Take that extra few minutes to really expound in your email and give all of the content that you think might be useful links. Oh my gosh, link to things. Um, instead of saying like, it's in this shared drive that we have, just grab the link and throw it in there. So that all they have to do is click. I worked at a tutoring center for a long time with students and it's kind of like herding kittens. And so my premise has always been to give over give, over provide so that like, there's no impediment to something getting done but oh, I couldn't find it or I didn't know what you meant. Like I try to like overshare so that like, all the expectations are there and all the resources are there as well. Um, so when should you connect synchronous, synchronously? And I think these are some really good guidelines. So if it's the first time meeting with someone, let's meet synchronously. Um, having regular standups, those are a really great way to check in with your team. I know that when we have team meetings at Text Expander, we reserve a bit of time at the beginning to check in with one another and see how everyone's doing and maybe share what we've done over the weekend if it's the beginning of the week meeting or what our intentions are for the weekend or what our plans are. Um, I think it really helps, again, reinforce that sense of community and, and helps us learn more about one another, but it also um, gives us an opportunity to connect synchronously. Um, and I think, Anytime that there's a high stake or when you're doing a one-on-one, -on -one, I think that's really important. Um, what about you, Dimitri? What are some other times that you all connect synchronously? Um, well, the I'm going to take the right side of the slide here. Um, <laughs> it's it's the, the sensitive topics, right? Uh, we've had this come up uh, quite a lot. Anytime there's emotions involved, it's uh, written communication can be a little bit uh, insensitive, right? And then, of course, uh, celebrations and uh, anything kind of positive, it's good to, um, to do it live. Well, actually, both, right? It's, 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 good, right. To, it's good to throw the, the, the confetti, right, emoji, um, but also to um, talk about it live. And then, um, you know, anytime there are more, let's say, yeah, I guess the rule is three back and forth communications on the same topic, but it's, you can kind of feel it out. I mean, anytime there's more than two, I think, is it's maybe time to uh, uh, to pick up the phone. Uh, and then of course, team building. So we, as we talked about it, uh, the, f the familiarity was one of the, the group flow triggers. It's just really important to have that. Um, no nothing beats drinks, right? At the, after work. So since we cannot do that, uh, substituting for that is uh, super helpful. 
Yeah. And to yes and this, and to use that terminology that we all love, um, I think it's also important to think about ways you can do like pseudo synchronous work. So, you know, that three or two or three back and forth, sometimes it might be someone asking you how to accomplish something. Um, and one thing that we use a lot is a tool called Cloud App, and it allows us to record our screen and to actually narrate what's happening there. Um, and I think so there's kind of like an in between as well where you can sort of it's quicker to just show sometimes. And so you can find ways to do that without necessarily connecting synchronously. But when you don't have that available to you, I think connecting synchronously is definitely super important, which is actually a good segue to our next topic, which is what kind of tech stack do you need? Um, so I'm gonna let you take email, Dimitri, because this is something near and dear to you. <laughs> sure, yes, very, very much so. Um, so email is probably the kind of the original asynchronous tool right it's um you know after the phone uh email was the only thing you could do well, i guess fax was maybe fax was the <laughs> take it back the letters and and written the letter. mail were, were the first asynchronous tool uh no but so in a, in the real world uh email is the um it's the perfect asynchronous tool because you send exactly sorry i guess fax um but um you know, you, there's no expectation of an immediate response in, in most cases, right? Uh, it's very much expected to uh, to respond not immediately, right? Whatever, whatever that whatever that means. In fact, some uh, email processing kind of best practices uh, even recommend waiting a day to respond, right? So don't respond to anything on the same day. Wait until day two. So it, it depends. I mean, I, I don't necessarily advocate that. But so as far as the tech stack, uh, you know, we at Sanebox have built our company around streamlining that inbound communication and having, um, you know, a, as the volume of emails continues to grow, the signal to noise ratio continues to get less and less. So there's just more and more noise and less and less signal. And so it's, uh, our brain is not designed really to, to be good at um, kind of identifying what's signal, what's noise. Uh, we're super prone to distractions. And so uh, what Sandbox does is kind of simplifies that for you and it puts all of the noise in one bucket and then keeps all of the important stuff in your inbox. And then we also use Text Expander to streamline outgoing communications, but I should probably let you talk about that, Rex. Yeah, I think um, we all have repetitive tasks that we do on a daily basis. So it's really about identifying those and putting them into a workflow. So Text Expander is really great at doing that. It's a knowledge activation tool. So you can actually pull that repetitive text out and, and throw it into an email and speed yourself up. Um, and also the cool thing is you get consistent in your messaging. Um, and so you can kind of hone down, you know, if there's, if you get certain kinds of questions a lot, you can really get that perfect response, save it and use it. And it's a lot faster than copy and pasting from that document that I know we all have um, full of, of frequently used text. Um, so, you know, kind of finding your flow is not just about like your mental state, but it's also about like your tech stack and what you have available to you and really optimizing, you know, not always can you just go out and get a new solution, but how can I learn how to, to leverage what I already have much more uh, efficiently, which kind of leads me into project management systems. I think that this is something that I just love. I love, I love lists. I absolutely love checking something off a list. So I think it's probably why I gravitate towards these, but like get yourself in order um, and, and figure out what works for you. It may not be any of these lists on here. There's a plethora of options out there. Um, but I think something that we do to ourselves that's a, a super disservice is we shortchange the planning process. Um, so like before you start a task, really sit down, map out what that task or that process or that, that project's going to look like and identify like, the points where you want to check in with yourself or you want to hold yourself accountable and throw that into a project man management system. Um, any time spent in the planning phase is never going to be wasted time, um, you know, as long as you're effortful and, and attentive. Um, so I think that, you know, it's important for us to really focus on finding the time to do it and committing to it and seeing it as, as just as valuable as actually doing the work for the project. Um, it'll save you time in the long run. Mm -hmm. Well, and actually the instant messaging tool uh, instant messaging tools are on here. However, as the name might suggest, they're instant messaging. So uh, there's been a lot of um, calls recently that I've seen to actually delete Slack from your phone uh, because Slack kind of by definition is more a lot more synchronous. So you don't have to reply immediately, but there is that expectation that it's 
more synchronous. However, that you know we're not going to delete it. It's it's very useful tool, especially for internal communication, and we all love Slack, uh, and some of us love Microsoft Teams. Uh, but it, it's just to, it's important to set uh, Rex, like you mentioned, uh, kind of to set the best practices and policies around what is expected, right? So maybe you're just expected to acknowledge or reply to Slacks within 24 hours. Like that's that's very that's helpful. And then of course there's um, there's some new tools such as Yak, which is voice instant uh, voice instant messaging, and uh, those you know are a little bit of a double also double edged sword because um, they while it's easy for for me to just you know leave a voicemail kind of to blurt it out and, and put it into the um, uh, into the uh, cyberspace. Either. Yeah, into the ether, but it's uh, it's not as great for the recipient because they have to you know stop what they're doing and listen to the message. And also, it's not great for documentation. It's um, it's very difficult to search a voice message. For sure. Um, I, which leads us to the last point, which is shared documentation. Figure out what your system is going to be and how you're going to set it up. Um, and ideally make sure that it's indexable so that it can be searched um, and really give yourself a leg up, right? Like, so create note formats so that, you know, you're creating a heuristic model so that you can identify easily at a glance where you want to start in a document um, and then be consistent with it. And <laughs> this is, I don't know that this is actually super important, but it is something that I care about. Be consistent in your naming convention so that it's easy to parse visually. Um, I think sometimes and maybe it's just me, but for me, I do notice that like, um, I think again, intentionality and, and being handbook first, right? So having an idea of what you want to do with shared documentation before you start documenting is super crucial. So how do you get started? So this is like a best practice that we found that can really help you kind of test the waters without being too committed. Um, so. Test out an asynchronous pilot, uh, where in the first week you try turning some of your synchronous meetings into asynchronous meetings. Um, how can you accomplish this? How could you, it, does this need to be something where we have to meet in person or can we, you know, leverage project management tools and documentation um, to do this asynchronously? Um, use those team collaboration tools like Slack and Trello or uh, Asana, whatever works well for you. Um, you know, you can also do like we, like I mentioned earlier, like the video recordings to get pieces that you can view later. Of course, like Dimitri mentioned, this doesn't always lend itself easily to documentation. Um, but one way, like a workaround that we've done is we've turned the links to the, like uh, if you're sharing a, a, a video uh, response, we've turned those links into snippets so we can still search for them um, and then revisit them in the future. Um, and then making sure that any meeting that you do, that you have a preset agenda, it's gonna help you stay on task, but it's also gonna help everyone involved prepare for that meeting so that the content is more useful, it's more enriched whenever you come to the meeting and it's not exploratory in instead. Um, and then experiment with a nonlinear workday instead of sitting down and saying like, I'm working today from 10 to six, nine to five, whatever that may be. Um, break it up, go get a good lunch, take some time and see how that rejuvenates you. Is that going to give you some more steam for the rest of the day to accomplish better tasks or to accomplish your tasks more effectively? So I think there are ways that you can kind of incorporate this without fully committing to see if it's something that works for you. Yeah. Well, and then the, the, the nonlinear workday is a really important. And I think that leads into the, our, into our uh, next slide perfectly. Um, there is uh, just a ton of research done relatively recently on, on this. So there is, the, we, we're based on cycles, right? Our, we evolved with the cycles and some of the cycles are, you know, multi-day. Some of the cycles are um, uh, daily. So like one hour you know, with the sun, right? So we evolved with the sun rise, rise and the sunset. And then some of the cycles are actually happen much faster. So we have a, 90 minute cycle throughout the day so we cannot literally we, we're not um uh ma machines that can just like work for eight hours a day of rex like you mentioned uh, it's just we're, we're literally it's uh, physically impossible right so we need breaks depending on um your kind of physiology most people suggest a 90 minute cycle where after 90 minutes you have to take a break uh, for me personally i know i need to take some a shorter break after 25 minutes uh, and then we kind of it really does depend but so um, 
back to the daily cycle, uh, there are, be, you know, because we kind of over the, you know, over the last uh, hundred or so years since the industrial revolution, we have kind of adjusted to the nine to five workday, right? Like that was, that's what everybody was doing. And so a lot of us have been kind of pigeonholed into being, I guess, I guess we would be larks, right? So, you know, being, you know, fully awake at you know, seven in the morning, depending how long it takes to get to work. And then from nine till five, we just we have to work, work, work. Um, depending on your biology, and this is actually not that changeable. We're kind of born with this. And there's most research suggests that we are, you know, you can't really change it. Uh, you can try to push it, but it's not, uh, it's not great. And so, um, there are really three groups of, of people. And so most of us fall into that middle category, but there are larks who are the early morning birds. There are owls who are you know, late birds and then third birds, which is everyone else. And so the way to find out who you are um, is to take a very, very short test. So take th think about the time you go to sleep. If you don't have anything to do in the morning, right? What time would you normally go to sleep? So for me, it's midnight. Then think about what time would you normally wake up if you had nothing to do in the morning. Uh, so for me, it's 8 a.m. And then you take the just literally the midpoint between those two times and put it on this graph. And so in my case, it would be four in the morning. So I'm right in the middle of a third bird, which I, I always thought I was an owl, actually. So I would always describe myself as an owl, but that's just not the case. Um, and, and so depending on this, this, this kind of sets the time for when you're expected to be at your peak. And so the, if you're a, a lark, it is a really good idea for you to set your kind of your busy time. Oh, sorry, not your busy time, your deep work time when you're, when you're, when you're doing your deep work, your highly focused work, right? Do that first thing in the morning. If you are an owl, do that in the evening, you know, eight, to even 10 or even midnight. I used to work after midnight because I kind of always thought of myself as an owl. And then I would, I realized over time that that would just destroy my next day. And then I was, I, I don't know what I'd be, I was someone else entirely after that, a, a zombie. Um, and, um, and if you're a third bird, it, it, you know, somewhere around 11 to two, is kind of the sweet spot. And then what you wanna do is you wanna set your, your deep work time during those times when you're most uh, awake, most functional. And then set your kind of routine work, your admin tasks for when you're more tired, right? And you can really experiment with this. And the beauty of this uh, new async world that we, that we live in is it allows us this flexibility to, you know, to do the pilot and, you know, you can do the pilot for the company. You can do the pilot just for yourself, just experiment with what works best for you. Um, really observe what's when you're most functional, observe what, what feels better and what, what results you you're able to achieve. Absolutely. And protect that deep work time. I think that's a great uh, space to talk about time chunking or time blocking. Um, when you know you're productive, that's when you don't want to be meeting. That's when you don't want to, unless the meeting requires you to be extra productive, but usually your deep work time is, you know, you're, when you're entering that individual flow. So block it off on your calendar and, and, and something that I think we all are, are prone to do is like maybe block it off to be like deep work for a chunk of time, but then actually set your tasks in there so that you're keeping yourself on task is another way for, to hold yourself accountable. It's something that I'm working on uh, being better at and it's not an easy transition, but it's definitely worthwhile. So um, based on this graph, and I do see we have a question about the times being PM instead of AM. Um, Demetri, do you wanna explain the, the X axis on this graph here? Yeah, so this is just the time. Uh, so the only purpose of this graph is to determine what kind of a animal or bird are you. Um, to take literally just take the, the, your your um, standard default bedtime and your standard default wake up time, find the midpoint between those two and put this on this graph. That's that's really all that this is this intended for. This is intended for. Um, and then yeah, and so the, the the action item is to or once you figure it out, that kind of sets 
the times when you can do, when you should be doing your deep work. So if you're a night owl, you can do it much later in the day. If you're a lark, you can do it earlier in the morning. And actually, you know, the, for third birds, which is you know sixty five percent of us, two thirds, um, we do kind of fall into that nine to five you know window but again it's it's important to keep in mind that this it's not you're not a tractor you're not a machine that's just going steady the whole time uh, a more uh, accurate analogy uh, is to think of yourself as a lion so the way lions uh, live and hunt is they you know they they hang out and sleep right and just kind of like lay, lay out and then they uh, go in for the kill whenever you know whenever they're hungry and so they go in for the kill they get their prey they come back and then they they go back to relaxing and now you know you don't necessarily have to chill out at, at, during during the work day but kind of think of that as as a better analogy because uh, we're not in, designed to be just steady machines we are closer to lions where we we can we can have these kind of shorter periods of stress and focus and then we need to recover and the recovery is absolute key uh, it's it's really if you think of um you know exercise or like, let's say building muscle uh, it's the same principle you're uh, it, it is based on this idea of uh, pushing yourself right just uh, stress and then recovery stress and recovery stress and recovery it's that cycle this is how you get better this is how you this is how you're productive we're again we're not designed to just be kind of mid-level um mi medium level stress we're much better at high stress and recovery than we are at um, kind of steady long-term stress absolutely that actually lends me to a resource i'd like to share called trainugly.com um, and this is really great for figuring out the overlap between like the physical and the mental um, and applying like sports uh, theory or uh, exercise theory to learning and also working. And so it's just like anything else, your brain is like a muscle. And so you do need those periods of effort and rest. And I think you can find some really cool tools on that website. One thing that I definitely want to recommend that you check out in Google is the Pomodoro method, because it will train you into using these, these cycles of effort and cycles of rest. And, and like you mentioned, Dimitri, like 25 minutes, you need a, a little break. It's built into the Pomodoro method. So I highly recommend you give it a Google. By the way, I, I just learned something else really interesting today. Um, so the our, especially on a laptop, that tw there's something magical about that 25 minute interval because our, I forget what, what it is, the uh, certain levels of a, min a specific mineral start to get depleted after 25 minutes on the laptop. I haven't verified this, um, but. <laughs> Dimitri, we had someone who wanted you just to kind of hit on the graphic on this slide again. Um, they were, there's a couple of folks that are just a little bit confused. Um, if you could just hit on that real quick. I know we're nearing the end of our time here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, sorry. This is, a, it's, I think the title of the slide is a little misleading. Um, so this isn't meant, uh, the, the chart you see is not meant as the, the actual time you should be working. This is only a chart to, to determine what kind of a bird you are. Um, so if you're, if you're middle midpoint between your bedtime and wake up time falls uh, on the red line, that means, or sorry, on the red um, bars, uh, you're a third bird meaning you are optimal kind of in the mid late morning to midday if you are a lark that means your your optimal deep work uh, focus time is early morning until 11 and if you're an owl that is you know late afternoon into the night hope that clarifies thank you dimitri mm -hmm. awesome so that actually brings us to the last slide. We won't cover everything on here, but these are just some tips that you can take away with you. We'll share this slide deck with you after the, after, um, the meeting today. Um, but it's really important that you figure out how to um, approach this. And uh, some of the best practices are listed on here. Like, you know, one thing that I think is super important when you're working asynchronously is get started with whatever tasks that you have ahead of you regardless if you have everything to get it done so that when you do actually, you know, if you're going back and forth and you're working with someone asynchronously, you've got all of your, all that you could get done, finished or accomplished when you do meet so that you're starting off on the right foot or maybe starting off a foot ahead. Um, and, and like we've mentioned on here, like protecting your time, 
um, questioning your meetings. And I think Dimitri has a really great perspective on what this means for leadership. Yeah. Well, so it's super important to set the direction and, and we kind of talked about the best practices and documentation and, you know, having that um, the employee handbook where you are very clear about what, what the goals are, how you're working, um, identifying the, the right tech stack um, is super helpful. And then, but also bringing um, the team into it, into the process and really asking everyone to share their preferences, like to, if your coworkers don't know if you're a lark or, or a night owl, that's a problem, right? Like they, everybody needs to know who you, uh, who you are. And, you know, we've, we do these, um, you know, we introduce this in our, um, in our team building activities where we talk about kind of our strengths and um, strengths and weaknesses. And we talk about what, what do we prefer and really make sure we structure our co-working around what's, what work, what works best for everybody. Absolutely. And I think the key takeaway here is iteration. Don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good. Um, so be okay with it not being exactly what you want and just get it out there and get it moving. And then you can receive the feedback and you can make it better every time that you do this. Um, so it, it is an ongoing process and we're going to continue to find more and better practices as we all continue working asynchronously. Um, so that brings us to the Q&A portion of the day. Thank you so much for your time. We want to open up to you and take some more of your good questions. Yeah, so there were a couple of questions as we were going through. I know we're short on time. So um, we were asked, or you all were asked, if you have seen the email helper tools of three sentences or four sentences. Um, sure if yeah, you guys are familiar with those at, at all or not. Yes, so I... Um... <laughs> The, the the idea was uh, or around those tools is to kind of introduce um, quicker uh, emails. So the problem that these tools are trying to solve is long, long, long paragraph emails where, uh, yeah, you know, it's just nobody wants to read that. Um, and having um, a shorter email is very, it's just easier to read. It's easier on the eye and it's less stressful for for pe person reading. Um, personally, I think it's a bit of a double edged sword. Uh, it really depends on the context like if, if if sometimes it needs to be a long email right it, it's there's no way around it and it's that's okay um some emails i mean it's always better brevity is always appreciated so certainly you can um always try to say with less words if possible but not at the expense of clarity not at the expense of um, you know making the recipient's job more difficult so if they have to decipher what you mean in the three sentences that's maybe not ideal. Thank you. I appreciate that. And another question we had was more directed towards text expander. So we had a question on best practices for naming and structuring abbreviations. And so for those of you that aren't familiar, abbreviations are how we actually expand our snippets inside of text expander. And so best practices um, that we teach everyone in the customer success department is to make your abbreviation short, easy to remember, and easy to type. Um, we do have an available inline search that's set up as a hot key directly inside of Text Expander for you for Mac users. That's command forward slash for PC window users. That's control forward slash. And if you are using a Google Chrome extension, that is control period. And so that will allow you to use a search box to then type um, you know, a word or a couple of letters that you're looking for. It'll pull up the different snippets that have that in its uh, abbreviation or in the label field. But definitely try to, you know, structure Structure those abbreviations, try to use prefixes before those abbreviations to limit um, accidental snippet expansion um, as you're typing words. So um, anything there else that you want to add, Rex, that maybe I missed or you can think of? Uh, to yes and you. I would say that like with the prefixes, I love prefixes and I think it gives you an extra um, search term, if you will. So like any of my um, snippets that are going to be an email start with em dot or how to snippets are how to dot. Um, so thinking about like what makes sense to you and maybe the how to dot breaks the, the, the short convention, uh, but like you want to make it searchable, you want to make it memorable, um, and I think you want to make it parsable. So like try not to get too up in the weeds with like, you know, just like letters for words, like make it readable so that if you do read it and you're a new user or you're sharing your snippets with others, um, they can make sense of what you're meaning there. 
Yeah, absolutely. And feel free to join us if you're wanting to learn more about Text Expander. We have webinars all the time. I know one of our, uh, co our co-workers dropped that into the uh, chat room there. So feel free to use that webinar link that was dropped in there. Are there any other questions? If there are, feel free to drop those into the Q&A. Otherwise, we are very near to the end of our time here. All right, D doesn't yeah. look like we have any other questions. So I just wanna thank you one more time for joining us today and learning a little bit more about asynchronous work and our approaches to uh, asynchronous work. Um, I wanna thank Dimitri for joining us today too. It's been a great time uh, yeah. working with you today. And thank Jen, of course. <laughs> yes. So yes. with that, if that's everything, I think we can go ahead and close it out. We'll get that recording out to you, the slide deck, and please don't hesitate to reach out to either of us. You've got our emails here on on the slide deck and our websites. We'd love to hear back from you on your feedback, what you liked, what you didn't like, and any uh, suggestions for new topics in the future. Yeah, future content, always welcome. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for spending your time with us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.